Well, today we're dealing with conflict, and uh, last week was part one. Today's part two, from offense to grace, defeating evil. And one of the greatest powers that God has given us over anything else is the love of God through Christ Jesus and the power of forgiveness. The enemy does not like forgiveness because it is the word, it is the action that destroys the work of evil like nothing else. Because the enemy's out to kill and destroy and to condemn. God's out to forgive, heal, and equip. And so we believe that. So today we're going to be talking about it. Now today's a little more of a, um, a fundamental. Uh, what I mean by that is the fundamentals. Like, you know, basketball, you dribble the ball, and you, just the basics of Christianity. But and people will teach you something deep. If you want to know something deep, it's living the life that God has called us to live. That's the deepest type of life you ever can have. An intellectual, ooh, how now neat is that, is not going to change your life. But what changes your life, when you take the truth of God, which is extraordinarily simple, but extraordinarily profound that you can never exhaust. And that's the love of Jesus Christ. So today, we'll be talking about how many folks um, like to deal with difficult people? Okay. How many folks know difficult people in your life? Okay. How many are married to difficult people? <laughs> Hopefully, people, one. Okay, we're not polygamy over here, okay? Uh, you know, no matter what you do, when you're in relationships, you're going to have trouble. It's the most rewarding part of life is relationships, and the most difficult and the most painful parts of life is also relationships. And so some people run away from them because they're very, very painful, but the good news is God is all about relationship. And I just wanted to start this initially uh, before we go any further is this, that if you're going to experience freedom... There's no way you're going to experience complete freedom without you giving your life to Jesus Christ. I'm just going to, I'm going to tell you right out of the bag. Why is that? Because the only way you can truly have good relationships is to surrender to the God of all relationships. Every relationship that we have is built upon who God is within himself and who he is with us. When that is aligned correctly, everything else changes. God is the author of every good and perfect gift comes from him. He's the creator of all things. The reason why you're able to sit in the chair you're sitting in right now is because there's molecules at a certain rate of speed that are coming together to form a solid. Without the molecules being under the law of God, God has, a, has, has basically laws, and these laws hold the universe together. The law of gravity, the law of thermodynamics, right? The law, all these laws hold us together. Now, if you work with the laws, you're blessed. If you go against those laws and violate those laws, you will hurt yourself. And so God has laws, and he also has laws of relationship. And these laws are not like inhibitors. They're freedom for you. God has designed relationships, and they only work a certain way. They only work God's way. When we have relationships out of God's way, we have chaos. And this is why we see what we're going on in our world today is people saying, I don't want to have relationships God's way. I want to have it my way. And I will say to you, well, today we're going to talk about something you may not like to talk about. It's forgiveness and dealing with conflict. And so today we're going to look at Matthew 18, and we're going to look at almost the whole passage. We're going to go pretty much line by line, verse by verse, and we're not going to just pull a verse out of context, but we're going to look at the whole, what it says. Very important, everybody. It's okay to teach, and it's okay to preach topically. There's nothing wrong with that, as long as the scripture you're taking is within the context of its original place it's found and the context of what you're speaking about. Does that make sense? You don't just pull verses arbitrarily, and this is what happens today. People pull verses arbitrarily without the context, and then they can make the Bible say Anything they want to. Context becomes a pretext, which comes error. And so we stand on the word of God here. Heaven and earth are going to pass away, but everything else is the word of God. Now, one of the things I, I want to bring to your attention is very, very important, is to understand the importance of forgiveness. You cannot give forgiveness to anybody unless you first received it. And some of you have really bad relationships and you have a lot of complication. If anyone says to you, I'm in a relationship and it's complicated, let me go ahead and parse what it really means. I'm in a, I'm in a relationship and there's a lot of sin involved. Because sin causes complications. God's love is simplicity, love, power, and freedom. And the only way you and I can truly have good relationships in the real sense of the word 
is that you need to first have a relationship with God. But here's the good news. I'm going to tell you something. You might make you feel a little better for a few moments. What's the most important thing you can do in life? Go ahead. You speak out loud. It's okay. It's in church. What? Receive Christ? Oh, man. You must be reading my notes. Okay. <laughs> Ignore what he just said, even though it's right. <laughs> I heard people say this. The most important thing we do is love God. No, it's not. The most important thing that you do is not loving God. The most important thing you do is not behaving correctly and doing the right thing. The most important thing does not mean that you live perfectly well and don't do anything bad. It doesn't mean that you don't smoke or drink or chew or go what girls would do. It doesn't mean any of that. What does it mean? What's the most important thing that you and I can learn to do is this. Ready? You ready? To receive the love of God through Jesus Christ. Until you receive the love of God, there's not much you can do. Receive the love of God, accept his love for you, and respond to it by giving your life to your creator and the author and the completer of your faith. That's how it all happens because you're designed by God for God and until you surrender your life to God, you're gonna be living out of sorts. There's gonna be something wrong, fundamentally wrong in your relationship. If everything is right and you're off a half an inch, your trajectory, you'll be so far from God, you'll be, it will be horrific. You see, and so really what I want to encourage all of us to do this, to receive the love of God. The Bible says, while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. You weren't looking for me. I was coming. I came looking for you. Okay, it doesn't mean we have a past to do what we want to. That would be the most hateful thing that God could do is give us over to ourselves. In fact, in the book of Romans chapter 1, when you know society is in a bad state of affairs, when God gives us over to ourselves, we're doomed. Unfortunately, we can see some of this happening right now in our culture. So what does this have to do with me? Everything. Because if your relationship is right with God and your relationship is right with the people he surrounded you with, you have power and you have polling power to make a difference in the world. We're kidding ourselves. If you and I think that we can make a difference in the world, but your personal life's a complete shambles, you're kidding yourself. So this is one of the most important messages I'll ever preach because it's the crux of everything that Christ has done for us. And I'm convinced, based upon the word of God, what I'm gonna share with you today, can radicalize your life in such a capacity, it can even bring physical and mental healing to you today. Why? Not because I'm a wise sage, I'm not. It's because I'm opening up the word of God and speaking the truth to what it is, and Jesus is truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So there's four ways to deal with conflict. You can't get away from conflict. Conflict's a part of life. Conflict's a blessing. We even heard it today, right? What, God, what the enemy meant for evil, God can turn to good. He doesn't cause the bad things to happen, but he can take the bad and make something good. There are four ways to do it. My way, your way, halfway, or what? God's way. God's way is the only way. Well, that's kind of narrow-minded. No, truth is, truth is truth. And God's way is the only way. So what Jesus does here is he tells us how to deal with conflict. And I would venture to say last week we, we went through some series of time. You can go to cornerstonecheshire.com. You can go to Spotify and, and type in Cornerstone Cheshire comes up with our playlist. You can listen to last week's sermon. You can go to iTunes, same thing, Cornerstone Cheshire. You can go to YouTube, Cornerstone Cheshire, and catch up. I'm not going to re-preach it, okay? But let's get to the really, what Jesus talks about here is very critical. And if we would do this, it would change everything. In fact, we mentioned last week that 70 to 80% of most of our conflicts is usually as a result of miscommunication and misunderstandings. But there's still a 20% that we still have to work on, and it's often the 10% that changes everything. Even notice they, 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 they sell something, kills 99.9% .9 of all viruses. But what about the 0.1%? Well, that's the one that will kill you. <laughs> right? Well, there, this one thing will kill your life in Christ more than anything else. And we're going to go through it right now. And if you and I will be real men and real women, okay, there's a lot of confusion today what it means to be a real man and a real woman. A real man and a real woman takes responsibility for their lives. A real man and a real woman does not placate. A real man and a real woman takes ownership of their problems so they can give it away. A wimp and a loser is one that abdicates its responsibility and blames other people. Losers blame. 
Winners take it on themselves. Now, how, how negative? Well, do you want to be a loser or a winner? God's called us to be winners, not losers. Okay? So how do you do that? God's way. Now, here we go. There's a situation where someone's been offended. And it's among Bible people. It's among church people. I'm going to give an example. If this is you, I have not spoken to your spouse or someone in the church. I'm just giving an example. Imagine, if you will, you hire someone at the church. And someone in the church, uh, can you fix my boiler? So they come to your house, and they put in, they install a new boiler. Within a week or two, the pipe breaks, floods your basement. You just spent $25,000 redoing your basement. It's all been destroyed, and your insurance company will not cover it. And now you're upset with the guy at the church that you hired, Joe Blow's Plumbing, okay? <laughs> with a name like Joe Blow, you don't want to hire somebody like that. You're going to blow it up, right? So anyhow, you call Joe, and Joe, hey, man, I told you I'll give you a good discount. See, first of all, let me just give you a, a, a point of caution and a point of warning. If you're doing business with anybody, even family members, Get it in writing. If you buy a car from your family member, it may have ran beautifully all their life. The moment they give to you, it blows up. Have it in writing. You know, I'm telling you right now, if you don't have it in writing, it's going to bite you. Is that clear? Get it in writing. Make sure you understand what this is the work I'm going to render to you. It's going to cost you X amount of dollars. I've heard it before. Pastor, they said it'd be 5000 Now they're charging me ten. Get it in writing. Okay, that's important. So that's, that's, that's an example. How about this? How about you're talking to someone and you're pouring your heart out to your friend. Man, I'm really hurt. And, uh, I had this relationship and he broke up or she broke up with me. And I'm, I'm destitute and I'm all out of love and so lost without her. <laughs> I knew you were right. Believe me, whatever, how it goes, right? And, uh, and, you're, and you're just telling someone what happened and, and your friend then goes on and tells some other friend, heard her from a friend, who heard it from a friend, who heard it from a friend, you were whatever, right? And so now it's going around everywhere, and you're like, what is going on? She betrayed me, right? So what do you do? I'm going to tell you that person's betrayed me to everyone else. And then they put it on social media. They put it on Snapchat. They put it on Instagram, right? And if they're really old, they put it on Facebook. <laughs> What's Facebook? Some of you are still on MySpace, Okay. What's MySpace? Never mind. Ever hear of AOL? Okay. How about LOL? Okay. So anyhow, so what happens is you need to go to that person, but what will happen? We start talking about each other. So now this person that installed the basement thing, I'm telling everyone else but him, and there's all this, this person now is seen as a crook. Now this young lady, this young man within, within the youth group, a young adult group, is seen as a gossiper, and the next thing you know, oh, she's a hoe, or he's a, he's a player, and all these words, that's what people say, by the way. They say all these words about someone, there's all this gossip going around, and now there's anxiety, there's frustration, and then there's, in, there's all these like internet posts and this and the other. People are putting stuff up, and it's double meaning, they know we're talking about you and there's chaos and that just goes on and on and on and then in the church the guy gets upset and then there's all kinds of arguments and then lawsuits and the lawsuits turn into whatever prison sentences whatever right this could all be changed by following this in fact this works for, across the board even for non-believers but especially for believers and I just witnessed over the last month two prominent preachers in America, don't look it up, that got in an altercation about some stuff, and they did not handle it like this. And as a result, it caused an embarrassment to a number of people in the body of Christ. And I, I, told, my, I, told, our, I told the folks, our, our, our ministry team here, Pastor Randy and, and everyone else and John and Sam and everybody said, hey, look at what happened. This is how not to do it. <laughs> Let's learn from this guy's mistake, Right? So what happens when you're offended? Because you're going to be offended. Can I, add, can I just promise you something? If I have not offended you yet, please give me a chance. I promise you I will. <laughs> okay? <laughs> it's not, not an excuse. Here you go. So you've been offended by somebody. Or how about this? Now, th I, this is all made up, okay? This is a fictitious story to illustrate a true point. Now, imagine for a few moments if this would happen. This would never happen. If you're an after the service and you're trying to get to a donut before they run out, and all of a sudden, you say, hi, Pastor Eric, and I walk right past you, and I run to Randy, and I talk to Randy, and I just blew past you. And you're like, who does he think he is? I'm, a, I'm just a small person? I'm not Randy, right? <laughs> so now you're bitter towards me, 
And now you talk to somebody else, right? You talk to Isaiah. Isaiah, the pastor said, Mr. 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 Big Shot here, huh? Can you talk to the little people, huh? And so now, yeah, I noticed that. And the next thing you go, I have this reputation. And the problem is, I got, the problem is, I sometimes, can I be honest with you? Sometimes I get laser focused and I, I just, I, I see Pastor Randy and I need to make sure that our live stream is on. We're going on to five minutes and it's not on yet. So I'm thinking of Randy right now and I don't see anyone else. And I, I walk past you and I blew you off. And that's really not very good. And I'm sorry about that. But if six months, this has happened to me. Someone told me about a year ago, you walked past me. If I pass you on the highway, that always happens. But now, what, what's going to happen? At least I didn't give you a pass, right? But, but so what happens? So listen, I'm not perfect, and I'm going to make mistakes, and so are you. So what you should do, if it really bothers you, please, you have permission to call the office and tell me. I'd be happy to meet with anybody, really, seriously. But don't do it on a Sunday morning. So anyhow, so then I meet with you, and we work it out. Now, what would happen if... All these circumstances, including the young adult relationship, the relationship within the, uh, doing uh, boiler work, and the relationship of me walking past you, if this is followed, this solves a lot of problems. Okay, here it is. If your brother, another believer, sins, misses the mark, that's what it means. Hamartio, that's what it means, missing the mark. That's all it means. That's what sin is. Okay? Against you, go and what? Tell him his fault. Go tell him the fault. Not call, and by the way, I do this too. Someone agitates me in the church. That never happens. If this, again, this is making this up just for the sake of argument. This would never happen. But one of the people in the church agitate me. So what I will do is I'll tell Sandra, I'll text Sandra, this person, blah, 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 blah. I'll go on and tell her what happened out of frustration because after all, the two shall become one and I'm just, sure, I'm just being biblical and I tell her that. And then later on that same day, I found it was a misunderstanding. We make up, we're fine. But I just never get around to tell Sandra because... I just forget about it. And now for days and weeks, she's thinking, this guy's a problem with my husband, blah, 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 blah. And she's getting an attitude towards a person. You see how that happens? But what should I do first? Go to God and then go to the person. Not even go to my wife first. And it solves so many, so many problems. This would solve most of the problems we have. I'm telling you, 70 to 80% of the problems have been miscommunication. The next 20% is improper conflict resolution. And there might come a point where you might have to separate, go separate ways, and that's fine. But at least do over the right situation, right? So, your brother sins, go and tell him to his fault between what? Just between you and me, right? Just between you and him or her. What? Alone. Now, I, I encourage you, if it's contentious, meet someplace neutral like McDonald's. Okay? Maybe Starbucks. I call it five bucks, but Starbucks. Uh, maybe meet some place where it's like, like open air. That's what I've done before. I've met people in a place where there's other people around me for accountability case. They get angry or something. Seriously, I'm not gonna take a chance. So just between you and him alone, okay? Then you tell the person, hey, listen, you, you and I had a conversation about putting the boiler in. This is what happened. Hey, you spoke about me. I'm on social media. That's not very nice. You're calling me all these names, but my whole reputation is this. Tell the person, what he, if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Now, this is for people in the church, fellow believers, okay? But a lot of times this will solve the issue. But if we don't do this, but if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you. So now I'll, I'll get Kevin McMahon. Who's that? I just made it up. Okay, I'll get somebody else. I'll get John, John Smith, Quincy Jones. We'll all get together. These are fictitious people in the church. And we'll get together, and we'll go meet the person, right? Hey, listen, you had this contract. You didn't do it right, blah, 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 right? Or you grab somebody else, someone, and the person, this is what happened, and you talk to the person, okay? But if he does not listen to that, take one or two more others with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So you want to have witnesses, okay? Can I just stop you for a moment? Can I just give you uh, the 11th commandment? Thou shalt not text during a conflict. Don't text, thank you. Don't text. If you're upset with someone, do not text them to solve it. Nothing good comes out of a frustrated text. Can I tell you I learned the hard way? 
A number of years ago, there was a confrontation that I had with someone, in, imagine that, in the church, and we're trying to rectify it, a lot of misunderstandings, and I was driving the car, and I was talking to Siri, Siri's still in her infancy, and by the way, Siri's pretty outdated, she needs to get updated to chat GPT, but that's beside the point, Stone Age. So I'm talking to Siri, and I'm saying, hey, listen, can we meet tomorrow, blah, 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 nothing really happened, and then Siri drops the uh, A, B, C, D, E bomb. And I, I caught it, and I stopped it from going out, thank God. Other times, I've been driving the car with one of my children. They're in the front seat. We have Apple Play, right, because I, I keep my eyes on the road, my hands on the wheels at all times. I never look at my phone, and neither do you. So I'm there. I'm texting to somebody, and she gets it wrong. I have to go back and forth and tell her again and again and again, right? And so imagine I get it wrong, and then Matthew hits send. Ah, no, don't touch the send, you know? <laughs> so something gets miscommunicated. So what happens is do not use text messaging for conflict or even emails. Whatever you write will be used against you. Do you know the conflict between these two pastors? The one pastor had the audacity to show and read the text messages over a broadcast where over 85,000 people looked at. Man, I just lost credibility for that. I'm not going to tell that guy anything, right? So do not do that. What you should say is, hey, listen, we have some concerns. Let's meet up to discuss something. What is it? We'll discuss it in, in person or at least the telephone. Okay, right there. You're saving yourself a lot of trouble. Can I tell you? I've avoided lawsuits. They almost had a lawsuit over misunderstanding because of, face, because of texting. Okay, I've learned. I got wounds. Okay, I got, okay. So if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Now you've had the two people come to help out. Now the person is still doing it. Listen, this person is working in a way that's not right. Tell it to the leadership of the church. Now, obviously, we're not going to, like, at every service, oh, by the way, Joe Blow from Joe Blow's Boilers is a crook. So we just excommunicate it. We're not going to do that. But we're going to tell the leadership of the church. Now, sometimes there's been circumstances a number of years ago Enough time has passed. I'm going to be very general. There was a situation in the church where someone violated our trust and lied to me, and I went through the Matthew 18, confronted the person, and they told me only part of the truth. It's like the tip of the iceberg. Literally, it was the tip of the iceberg. And I said, okay, we're going to help you out. And then what I did, I got another, uh, another uh, board member came with me. We met with the two or three. We were there with them. We offered them help. Hey, listen, we'll fly you down for special counseling. We'll pay for it. We're going to help you out. And he would not listen. We're not listen. We're not listen. Then I told the board this, and we got together, and we talked to him and said, you're no longer welcome here anymore because you're not abiding to what we say. Now, we were on vacation a couple weeks ago. We were visiting someone in Myrtle Beach, and a friend that used to come to the church. He said, Pastor, I remember that one Sunday where you said heads are going to roll. <laughs> I said, what happened? Don't you remember? Oh, and so it did happen. No heads rolled, but the person was coming to the church and they were going to defy us excommunicating because they needed to be excommunicated. So I had the police ready to go. I told the police, if this guy shows up, escort him out. He's out of line. He's causing trouble. And literally, there could have been, there could have been a violence here at the church. I don't get into more than that. Okay? So we dealt with it. And I can honestly tell you that enough years have gone by where I prayed for the person I've talked, I literally pray, and I have no angst against them at all. I don't, but I don't trust them at all because they never faced it at all. So that's an example of what can happen, okay? I'm just telling you the tr what's going on in life, okay? So you tell it to the church, and then you treat him as, if he refuses to listen, tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a tax collector and a Gentile. And so what that simply is, a tax collector and a Gentile, a tax collector was the scum of the scum. You had nothing to do with them. A Gentile was someone the Jewish people had nothing to do with. So even Paul said, I've handed over Demas to Satan. In other words, I, I give him over. I'm not putting curses on him, but okay, you can have it your own way. And when you, when you deny God, God says, go ahead, have it your way. You're in trouble. So God, you take care of that person. And we've seen God take care of people for us. I'm just telling you, I'm not trying to be mean. And I don't even, I, I just say, God, you take care of me. He takes care of it. Now, I want to review a few things about steps of confrontation. And then we're going to look at some explicit detail, what it means to forgive somebody. 
and how to do it. You guys ready? Okay, here are the steps. First thing you do when you're offended, go to God and check your heart. The Bible says before you take the what? Speck out of your brother's eye, take the what out of your eye. Okay, Lord, have I cheated anybody in what I said before? I know I don't have Joe Blow's boiler system, but did I ever do, Lord, did I ever gossip about somebody and not go to the person? God, did I ever do this and the other? And ask yourself the question. You know, I actually, I kind of did before. Look at yourself. Lord, search my heart. Know if I'm right or wrong. And by the way, I say this all the time. Two things you're going to hear me say all the time. The best days are always ahead for Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus. And if something troubles you, makes you happy, makes you sad, makes you angry, makes you fearful, go into diagnosis mode. God, why am I feeling this way? Why am I happy about this person failing their test? Why am I happy that I'm feeling this way? Why am I anxious about this, right? And ask yourself, find out the reason why. Well, they make me angry. No one makes you angry. You choose to be angry. So find out the reason why. The reason you're angry for is you feel, in, you feel insignificant. You feel you've been slighted. Okay, tell God. God, I feel I've been slighted and I feel like I've been gossiped against. Good. Tell the Lord how you feel. Own it first, Right? You can't get rid of something until you own it. So go to God, check your heart. Once you've done that, here comes step two. Don't call your spouse or your louse, whatever. Go to the brother or sister alone, right? Go to them. Just between you and me, okay? Take two or three others with you that are, are gonna be of good, repute, good, good, um, good standards. After that, tell it to the church and then break off relationship, and here's the final one, pray and wait. There's some people that I've just broken relationship with. And, fi- and by the way, when the Bible says, go to your brother and show their fault, the very first step, the word fault there in the, in the Greek is the same word for evangelization. So help bring Christ into your relationship, not show that you're right. Oh, reminds me of Joshua. Before he went into Jericho, he saw an angel there with a sword. He goes, are you with them or with us? You know what the angel says? Neither. I'm with the armies of the Lord. So it's not about you winning an argument. I want to evangelize our relationship, that Christ is in the center of it. That's the word used. Go to your brother. So, then Jesus goes on, and I, I'm not going to read this right now. He talks about two or three gathered in my name, and so this is within the context of church discipline. Uh, for, for, they're going to forego that for now, but it, it's connected. For where there are two or three gathered in my name, there I'm in among them. So we often quote that all the time, right? Where two or three are gathered, where God's not. No, this, that actual verse has to do with church discipline. However, the inferences and the principles of that is true. When we gather together, God's in the midst of us. You follow me? But it talks about these various things. Then we get into the next part. Then Peter came up. So Peter just heard this teaching about going to your brother and all that, right? Then Peter said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Now, let me just stop there for a moment because in the rabbinic traditions, they had basically, you know how it goes, once, twice, three times, okay? In the first service, I said once, twice, three. The person said three times in a lady. It's <laughs> one, twice, three strikes, and you're out at the old ball game. So where do you think MLB got it from? The rabbinic tradition. Okay, so Peter's like, he goes, I'll just one-up it here. I'm going to be a double and add one. So, Lord, how often will my brother sin? So he's basically, he's describing, he's describing step one. What's step one? Your brother does something, go to your brother, right, and get it right. So he's thinking, well, how many times do I have to go through that? He goes, seven times? No. As much as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times seven. Now, some of you are sitting there, that's 490, I'm going to have hash marks. Now, that's not what he's doing Basically saying, continue to forgive. 
Now, it doesn't mean that you get to an abusive, destructive relationship. If you've been abused or been molested or swindled or something and a person is dangerous, the best thing you can, if you have a pit bull that bit you and you had, you had to get shots and stitches, the best thing you can do is not be like Governor Noem and shoot him, but the best thing you can do is, is to contact the person so you have a dog that's dangerous, right? And report that dog before it kills somebody else. So, okay, so if something goes wrong, what you have to do is you have to make it right, okay? So if someone is dangerous, I'm gonna call the police, but I'll still forgive them, okay? Because now I'm being hateful by not protecting somebody else, all right? If something is dangerous, it's gonna hurt somebody. Now, if you're doing it for vengeance, it's wrong. That's why you have to get your heart right. That's another topic within itself. So as we move on here, as Jesus says, therefore, a kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. So Jesus is answering Peter's question. How many times? 70 times seven. And here's a story to illustrate. So here we have someone who owes him. When he brought to settle, one who brought him, how much did he owe him? Well, look at it here. And since he could not pay his master, ordered him to be sold. Let's go back to here. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, what are talents? It's a, uh, it's a way of, of um, measuring money. Now, a talent would be basically like a, a year's wages. An average year wages, according to Mr. Google this morning, chat GPT did not know it yesterday, so I kept looking it up. Some people say it's $54,000 is the average salary. If you live in New York, it's like 80, but that's beside the point. So, so what happens is imagine $54,000 times 10,000. And then some scholars say it's even into the trillions. Depends how you what a talent is. Is it gold? Is it silver? So let me just say this. It's an exorbitant, exorbitant amount of money that you can never pay. That's the point of the illustration, okay? So when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. This is what they would do in those days. So you owed something, you go to prison, and your, your kids and your family would go into slavery. Now, what's so interesting here, in the understanding of the culture at that time, they had something called satraps. What that simply was, you had the governor, you had Caesar, you had Caesar who seized everything. And so Caesar would have someone like Pontius Pilate, and Pontius Pilate's des uh, design and purpose was to keep peace in Jerusalem, and Rome would give him resources and money. He had to manage it well to manage peace. And if he didn't manage peace, Caesar would ask Pontius Pilate, hey, what's going on over here? So apparently this guy blew all of his responsibilities and had a negative balance that was incredible. So we say, hey, you, you blew it, okay? God has given all of us talents to manage. So, verse 26. So the servant fell on his knees, which is a way of saying help, impl impl imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. No, he cannot pay him everything. Give me a break. Even if you work at McDonald's at 35000 an hour, I saw $25 an hour, but I'm just adding it out for effect. And you could never make enough money, right? So have patience with me and I will repay everything. And out of pity for him, and the word pity there used is used for Jesus. Jesus saw them and his, he gave his heart to them. His heart went out to them. So the word pity there in the Greek is his heart went out to him. He felt for him. He felt bad for him. So the, the judge felt bad. His heart went out to him. And what did he do? The master of that servant released him and forgave him all the debt. When you gave your life to Jesus, God, his heart went out for us. For God so loved the world that he gave, right? We respond to it. We're forgiven. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. Which, what's a hundred, a hundred, a day's wage, a hundred days wages. Okay, maybe he owed him a 
I don't know, six, 7,000 bucks. You can pay that off, right? But what does he do to him? And seizing him, began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down, same thing, and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. Now, could the guy pay him? Yes. That amount he owed him was something you literally could pay off. We're not talking trillions of dollars or even millions of dollars. We're talking something that is seven, eight thousand, whatever it could be based upon the, how you do the work of the money system. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they were, went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Now let's check this out. Then his master summoned him. He did the first step, go to your brother. And said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Now, what God is saying here is when you don't forgive, you're being what? Wicked. What is the devil called? The accuser of the brethren. His job is to get you thrown into hell forever. And so he says, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should, I, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy upon you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all of his debt. Will he ever be able to pay his debt? So also, my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your what? Okay, so hand them over to the torturers. There are people today that are being tortured with torment of depression, anxiety, cancer, arthritis. Now, I'm not saying depression, anxiety, arthritis, and cancer is from unforgiveness. But it could be part of the... Not, I'm not saying that if you have that, that's the reason. But it could very well be science has shown us that bitterness and anger and all these things are bad for your health, bad for your mental health. And what happens also is you eliminate God from you and the devil goes, can I meddle in their affairs? Yes, you can. They've rejected me. And you open yourself up to the attack of the enemy. I'm telling you right, I'm not joking with you guys. This is serious. So for you not to forgive after you've been forgiven is demonic. It's satanic. And you're basically saying, here I am, Satan, come into my life. I give my life to you. How can you say, that's what you're doing. Because you're basically ripping Jesus off the cross and beating him, beating him up. Because everything he did was about forgiveness. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. We're not the judge. So, Jesus says, he tells the Lord's Prayer, right? Remember the Lord's Prayer? Father, forgive me like I forgive others. In that prayer, it says before then, give us this day our daily bread and Forgive us as we forgive our, our debtors. So daily bread and daily forgiveness are necessary. They're in the same phrase, same phrase, same understanding. Every day, you and I need to give, you need to receive forgiveness and you need to give forgiveness. So if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive you your sins. What does that mean? Once saved, always saved. Ah, oh, doesn't, no, I'm not gonna get into that. Does that sound like a good idea? Do you wanna put God to the test that way? Well, let me just say this, okay? You know apple trees, right? Let's well, suppose you're, you're an apple tree and you're in an apple tree grove. Bishop Farms, okay, I'll just go ahead and give them little props. So you go to Bishop Farms and they have these apple trees and every other tree is giving apples. It's October and your tree is giving no apples. It's an apple tree, but it's not giving any apples. What does that mean? It means that the tree is sick and perhaps dying. If you're a Christian and you have unforgiveness in you, you are a sick Christian. It could be that you're dying spiritually. Don't play with that. Don't play with that. You're inviting satanic occupation, not possession, but you're inviting the enemy and pushing God away. See, the Bible says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, what? Be kind to each other. Tender what? Forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has 
forgiven you. This is how we do it. I like what C.S. Lewis said, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Let me say a few other things about forgiveness. How do you do it? Well, here's this really important aspect, okay? Your relationship with the closest people to you reveals your relationship with God. The best mirror I have with my relationship with God is my relationship with my wife, Sandra. If I have a bad relationship with her, then I more than likely have a bad relationship with God. If I'm neglecting her, I'm probably neglecting God. You cannot separate personal relationships with God. How can you say that? Well, I'm so glad you asked. If anyone says, I love God, and what? Hates his brother. He is a what? For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So if you can't love the people that God has put before you, you're not going to love the people that you don't, you're not going to love God who you do not see. All right? And this commandment, whoever loves God must also love his brother. But the only way you can love your brother is you have to be loved by God. And the only way you can be loved by God is you have to forgive yourself. Hello? I'm no good. What I've done is so bad. You know what you're doing? You're negating the blood of Jesus. You're saying, you're prideful. What I've done is so bad, God can't forgive me. Oh, really? Then you're basically telling God, hey, God, your blood is not good enough for what I've been through. That's arrogance. Forgive yourself. But I don't feel forgiveness. I understand that. I understand that. You see, choices lead, feelings follow. You make a decision to forgive. If you wait for feelings, you'll never forgive. Yeah, but I want to be authentic. You're going to be authentically stupid. <laughs> I don't want to go to work today. If I go to work, I'll be inauthentic. Good. You'll be in a welfare line. Hello. God says forgive. Forgive. Be a man. Be a woman. Step up to the plate and say, you know what? I'm going to forgive this person. I don't feel it. Lord God, I gave it. How do you do it? You keep giving it to the Lord. This this morning, I was going through my notes again, and I was thinking to myself, oh, I think I'm pretty good with it. Uh, oh, and I realized there's someone that I have forgiven, but I just kind of hope things go bad. Oh, what does that mean? I still got to pray for them. Lord, bless them in Jesus' name. Lord, bless them like you would bless me. Oh, I've done that before. That helps. And I have to do it, and I have to do it, and it goes away. And sometimes it keeps coming back, right? Sometimes if someone, does, especially with there's repercussions from that. Maybe you're divorced, right? And things are going well, and then all of a sudden they start speaking bad about you to the kids. Oh. Oh, right, and you have to go, oh, Lord, I forgive, Lord, I forgive, right? It's, okay. No one knows what I'm talking about, of course, okay? Choices lead, feelings follow. Now, Corey Tamboon, tremendous woman of God who was born in 1898 and died in 1993, was involved with the Second World War. She's from Holland. Her and her family rescued over 700 Jewish people during the Holocaust. And by my friends, we have the same seedlings of the Holocaust right now across our world and in college campuses. And it's not the people. It's a satanic delusion. It is spiritual warfare. If you don't think there's spiritual warfare, you don't know what's going on. It makes absolutely no sense to hate the Jewish people. It's demonic. Other, I'm telling you, you're being political. No, I'm being biblical. We pray for, okay, wait, I'm getting to that right now, but that's what happens. So back in this time, this is what was happening. They were blaming the Jews for everything. And they hid 700 of them in the walls of their house. It's called The Hiding Place. A tremendous book. Woman of God. So her and Betsy, they get caught in their families. And they were put in a concentration camp where they kill people, starve them. She was bitten by fleas. I mean, it was bad. And Betsy was mistreated, her, her sister, and was eventually killed. Corey Ten Boom gets out. She forgave everyone. She spoke on the speaking circuit. She was interviewed by tremendous people. Billy Graham had made a movie about her. She was all around the different place. So I'm going to read to you a, 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 an excerpt from her book or a, from an article where she was at a church ministering, speaking, and she came into contact with somebody 
That was part of that concentration camp. I'm going to go ahead and read it to you, okay? At a church service in Munich, where I was speaking, I saw the former SS man who had stood guard at the so-called shower room in the processing center at Rosenbrook. With other guards, he had run his hand over naked bodies as they went through and responded callously to requests for help. He was the first of our actual jailers that I'd ever seen after the war. And suddenly, here it was again. The heaps of clothing she saw. Betsy's pain-bleached face. So she gets done speaking. When he came up to the church at the end, it was emptying out, he came to me. He said, how grateful I am for your message, Fräulein. To think that, as you say, he has washed away my sins. He puts his hand out like that. His hands was thrust out to shake mine, but my hand stayed at my side. All of a sudden, boom, she got whacked with something, like a post-traumatic stress on forgiveness, right? Very vengeful thoughts boiled in through me. I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand. I could not. I silently prayed, Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. As I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder, along my arm, and through my hand, a current seemed to pass while into my heart sprang a love for the stranger that almost overwhelmed me. What you and I need to do is obey the word of the Lord. You need to forgive that ex-spouse. You need to forgive that person that hurt you. You need to forgive yourself. And you need to be honest and say, I cannot forgive them. God, give me power to forgive. And then what do you do? You obey. You trust and you obey. Father, I forgive them in Jesus' name. Comes back, Lord, I forgive them in Jesus' name. Father, I forgive them in Jesus' name. And by the way, a little bit of advice. Don't go to them and say, I forgive you in Jesus' name. Don't do that. <laughs> that's, like, that's like a back, back, backhanded slap. If they come to you and ask for forgiveness, that's different. I had someone come to me, I forgive you. I'm like, you basically have, oh, never mind. Then I had to forgive them for not forgive. Okay. <laughs> but the only way you can truly forgive is that have you been forgiven? Have you given your life to Jesus? I'm going to ask you to close your head. Close your eyes and bow your head, please. Don't close your head, though. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you close your head by looking at your phone. Put the phone away. I'm going to bow your heads for, for a second. Let me ask you guys a question right now. Is there anyone right now that you're having unforgiveness towards? Maybe it's yourself. Maybe you're disappointed with yourself because you blew the marriage. Maybe you're the one that, if anyone ever knew what I really did in the business, what would they do? My parents ever knew. My friends ever knew what I did. I'd be canceled. And maybe you're living with this sense of dread and you feel like you can never, ever be back on Team Jesus again. You're just going to be benched for the rest of your life. And you can't forgive yourself. Let me just say right now to you as your eyes are closed. Receive the forgiveness of Jesus. Jesus.